I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Because I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Till every dark addiction starts to break. Declaring there is hope within your presence. I speak Jesus. Because your name is power. Your name is healing. Your name is life. Break every stronghold. Shine through the shadows, turn like a fire. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over fear and all anxiety. Till every soul held captive by depression. I speak Jesus, because your name is power, your name is healing, your name is life, break every stronghold, shine through the shadows, burn like a fire. Shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus from the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy, Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name of Jesus. Shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy, Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name of Jesus.
want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. There's peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. Shout Jesus from the mountains. Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy, Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name of Jesus. Shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets. Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name of Jesus. Shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets. Shine through the shadows, burn like a fire. Your name is power, your name is healing, your name is light. Break every stronghold. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Because I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. that holds so much power, the name that is above all names. For it is at the name of Jesus that every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess 
that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And Lord, today we humble ourselves in your presence. We humble ourselves at the name of Jesus that is high and lifted up and above all that brings healing, that brings restoration and reconciliation. The name of Jesus that does all things well. And so, Lord, today we in unison just simply speak the name of Jesus over every situation that we may be going through. Lord, what no matter what anyone is going through in this sanctuary or those that are going through online, it is in the name of Jesus that there is life. It is in the name of Jesus that there is resurrection and power. Lord, we ask that you would move by your spirit and that we would be reignited with you. Lord, that we would be reminded of that great day the greatest day that is all known to all mankind, the day when the tomb could not hold you, but you came out alive and victorious out of the tomb, and now you're seated at the right hand of God the Father, ever to make intercession for us. And it is all in the name of Jesus. Lord, if we ask anything in your name believing, it'll be done, and we praise you for it. And now, God, just have your way as we move in this area. We pray, Lord, that you would speak to us through the word and that, God, it would encourage our hearts to realize that we are, have not been overcome, but we will overcome. And so, Lord, I pray your blessings now to be upon us. Bless the word as it goes forth. And we'll give you the praise, the honor, and the glory for it. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Hallelujah. I love that course, I speak the name of Jesus. Because there is power in the name of Jesus. We know that all we have to do is rely upon him, call upon him, and we know that he will do great and mighty things on our behalf. We want to welcome each and every one of you into the sanctuary this morning. We are so glad that you are here and joined us together as we celebrate the resurrection of Christ, as we lift his name up and we recognize that Christ is risen. And we all hear the report is risen indeed. We thank God that we serve a risen Savior. I like that old hymn that says, I serve a risen Savior. I know he's in the world today. No matter what men may tell me, no matter what men may say, he lives, he lives, he lives within my heart. Thank God for a living Savior. This morning at this time, we want to receive our morning tithe and offering as we have opportunity to give to the Lord, knowing that God has placed before us this desire to give and to respond to his goodness in our giving. And so we're going to ask our ushers if you would come, please, and receive our morning tithe and offering as we give to the Lord as he has blessed us. Father, we thank you for the many blessings that you have bestowed upon us. We could never repay you for anything that you've done for us because it is at the blood of Jesus that we have had the remission of our sins, something that we could not have done on our own, but that you did for us. And so, Lord, I pray that you would move upon our hearts and help us to be free and liberal in our giving as you have been giving and liberal in your giving to us. God bless each one who gives. Bless each gift that is given. Let it be for your glory and for your honor. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Shout Jesus from the mountain, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy, Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name of Jesus. 
Shower Jesus from the mountains. Jesus in the streets. Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family. I speak the holy name. Oh, Jesus. Come on, church, sing it out. Shout Jesus from the mountains. Jesus in the streets. Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family. I speak the holy name of Jesus. Shout Jesus from the mountains. I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Thank you so much, worship team. You may be seated this morning. You know, we sing that chorus that almost makes me want to shout. When we think of who Jesus is and who has demonstrated him, us to him or him to us to be, he is the living Lord and he lives in our world today. Thank God for an empty tomb. Amen. I thank God that the tomb is empty. It could not hold him. There was nothing that could bind him. He is alive and he is well in our world today. Some may have thought it was over, but we got good news for him. It's not over until he says it's over. Amen. Let's give God a hand. Praise God. Praise God. This morning I want to share with you in that very subject, it's not over until it's over. We're going to be looking at John chapter 20 beginning with verse 18. John chapter 20 verse 18. We find the Easter story in the, in the Gospel of John in the 20th, and then it goes on into the, or the 19th chapter concerning his death, and then into the 20th chapter concerning his resurrection. But I want to look at John chapter 20, verses 11 through 18 this morning. You come into a portion of Scripture in the 19th chapter when Jesus said, It is finished. And with that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Jesus said it was finished when he hung upon the cross. He gave up his spirit and he died. And for many, there was great turmoil. There was tra drama within their lives to know that their beloved friend and their kingdom uh, maker and kingdom giver was now dead and gone. And I can imagine the scene as the disciples and those that were gathered in love with him were very distraught in, in agony and in torment, in pain and in grief. And it looked like in the eyes of Satan that there was defeat. 
It looked like to Satan it was finished. To the religious crowd, they thought it was finished. They thought they had silenced the myrrh and the word of Jesus. However, this isn't what Jesus meant when he said it is finished. Jesus was saying that I have completed what I have come to earth to do. I have given my life for sin and I give paid the penalty by my death. Jesus' resurrection really is a declaring of the victory for all who trust him. Everyone who trusts him today is a day of celebration because we serve a risen Savior who's alive. We serve a Lord that is living, a Lord who died and gave his life for us, but the death and the tomb could not hold him. And we rejoice in the fact that we are serving one who is seated at the right hand at the throne of God. Now, after three years of ministry, we find Jesus arrested for his claims of being the Son of God. He came to bring good news to the kingdom of God, and he performed many miracles on his way to the cross. But there was a crowd called the Pharisees that wanted to see Jesus silenced because he posed a threat to their control. Then we have a Roman government who likewise wanted to see the silence, the voice of Jesus. They wanted to see Jesus dead because he was gathering a great following of believers that were following him, and they were concerned about them being a threat to his, their power. And then we could see Satan. We can almost imagine the glee that Satan was going through as he recognized that Jesus was dead. And I can imagine that these three entities got together if they could, and they were wringing their hands and saying, Ah, it's over now. It's over now. It's all over. He's dead. He's silenced. He'll never hear his word. He'll never hear his voice again. He's gone and never to be remembered. And they wrung their hands. But there was something they did not understand. And there was something they did not know. And that is, it is not over until he says it's over. And when God says it's over, then we can rise and to be with him in the air. And all three of these forces were coming together, and they met on that first Easter morning. They met in that place of the crucifixion, where those three things, the powers of the Pharisee, the powers of the Roman government, the evil powers, the demonic powers, all met into one place rejoicing in the fact that Jesus was dead. Let's look at our text. This morning, we see that Jesus was nailed to a wooden cross. He was lifted up between two thieves. He was bloody. He was naked. He was shame. And if it ended there, it would be the most hideous ending that there could ever be. But thank God it did not end there because we know that it ends with an empty tomb. John chapter 20, and I'll be reading verses 11 through 18. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said. I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it that you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener. She said, sir, if you have carried him away, please tell me where you have put him and I will get him. And Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned around him, uh, toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Robonai, which means teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet been ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and to your God. And Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And they, she told them, that he, that he had said 
these things to her. We see the final words of Jesus' life on earth was, it is finished, and then he died. But you know, in all reality, it was a finish that was not the end. It was a finish that they may have thought they had that they had brought about, but it was not the end of what was going on. The Roman soldiers had to check on the three that had been crucified, the two with Jesus and Jesus himself, to make sure that they were all dead. And sure enough, they were dead. The man that they believed to be the Christ, by God coming into the world to rescue the world and to set up a new kingdom, now they say, he's been killed. He's dead. And we can imagine the glee and the exuberance and the shouting and the, and the joy that was seen in the time of the, the Romans and the Pharisees and the, and the demonic powers and rejoicing that he is dead. But not only do we see their glee and their joy and their rejoicing, what about the hearts of the believers? Those that loved him, those that had walked with him his three years of ministry upon this earth, and yet they had seen him crucified. They had seen him dead, and he was gone. And I imagine on one side there was a rejoicing and a celebration because he was dead and gone, but on the other side there was grief because they held on to the truth that he had taught them, the things that he had said, and the things that he had done. The Pharisees were rejoicing because they thought they had won. The Roman government thought it had won. Satan and all of his evil were confident that they had won. They thought, well, Jesus is finished. And it looked like all hope had been lost. It looked like the plan of God had a setback. But I want to assure you this morning, there was not a setback. It was a setup is that God had a plan and he had a purpose and it was involving an empty tomb and his son Jesus giving his life for the atonement for the sins of the world. We all would be lost in our sin here this morning. We would all be captured in the arms and the hands of demonic forces if it would not have been for the name of Jesus and for the one who gave his life and the one who cried it is finished. But he said in reality it is not finished. It is just beginning. You're just beginning to see the reality of a risen Christ. You're just beginning to see the reality of a Christ who said, I will go away for three days, but on that third day, I will come again and I will rise out of the tomb and death will lose its grip and its power and I will be given the power over death, hell, and the grave. And God gave us that gift, and that's the hope that we cling to. And so when there was a rejoicing by the demonic power, I can imagine right now there's a lot of silence when they recognize that we as a body of believers have gathered together to worship a living Lord, and we we very boldly declare he is alive, he is alive, he is alive, and the demons must shudder at the idea that they thought he was dead but we have good news. He's alive, and he's alive forevermore. Bless the name of the Lord forever. Amen and amen. Some of us might have that sting in our lives. Maybe you're going through a setback right now, whether you're viewing online or in the sanctuary. Maybe it's the death of a loved one. Or maybe it's discouragement that you're going through, a depression that you're going through. Or maybe it's a lingering health issue that you're involved in and you're struggling your way through and and wondering if there's ever going to be an end, if there's ever going to be a case where it will come to a ceasing. Maybe you're going through situations in your own life, in your own family. Maybe it's a prodigal child. Maybe it's a spouse who isn't serving the Lord and you desire that they serve the Lord but maybe there is something in your life that is bringing you to that place of a setback and you can feel like it's so final in so many ways, 
Sometimes we may feel like, well, it's something that we'll just have to go and have to endure for the rest of our lives, and then we'll see Jesus. Or sometimes we might say that this individual will never be saved. I remember one individual that that was said, and his wife had prayed very fervently for him over and over and over again. And I remember one night that he got physical with her. She came to the parsonage. And about midnight, there was a pounding on the door. It wasn't a knock. It was a pounding. And we knew exactly who it was. I looked out the window of the bedroom, and there he was standing there at our house. And I knew that he went for one thing. And that one thing that he meant was not going to be good. And he, she prayed and she prayed for him. And some may have said, well, there was really no help for him. There was no way that he would ever come to know the Lord and never come to accept and, and to recognize Jesus Christ as the Lord of his life. But as prayer continued, as prayer continued to go on, that setback de determined an outbreak. He came to know the Lord, though he didn't continue in the, with the Lord, but he came to know the Lord at that point. And there was peace then, and there was tranquility because he, that they thought was no good, that he was no use, and that we could never be saved, was saved. And maybe there are some of us going through situations like that in our life today. It just feels like, and maybe some of them have said, I'd rather die than I go through this we got good news for you if you know what it feels like you know what it feels like to be broken you know what it feels like to be ashamed we know what it feels like to be hopeless and lost and so it's all dark bleak and dark and then all of a sudden out of nowhere Easter comes Easter comes and with Easter brings us hope and reality. In the 19th chapter of the Gospel of John, we see that Jesus' words were, it is finished. But he was only saying that he was accomplishing what God had sent him on earth today. And what he was saying is things have only just begun. So no matter what the dark situations you may be going through may be, no matter what the, what the case might be or the situation is, and what may appear in this present, we, the hope of Easter is that nothing is over until Jesus says it's over. Nothing is over until Jesus says it is over. Notice in John chapter 20, in verse 11 through 17, We read it as a text in the, in the earlier, but Mary stood outside the tomb crying, weeping, because Jesus was no longer in the tomb. She knew that he had been crucified. She knew that he was dead. And she came to the tomb, and the angelic being, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? And she said it was Jesus. And then Jesus as she saw the man she thought was a gardener, and then Jesus spoke her name. When Jesus speaks your name, it's going to change your life. When Jesus calls you unto himself, you see, after Jesus was crucified, his body was laid in a tomb three days after the seemingly defeat that came one morning early in the morning, Mary went to the tomb to finish anointing the body of Jesus for burial. And she had resigned herself to the fact that he was dead and with him were their hopes and their dreams of the new world that they were hoping that he would come to set up in a, from the oppression and from the evil. Her surprise, things are not what they expected. And she sees him in that text. And he speaks her name. But you see what I see in this this morning. Jesus' death may have looked like a setback to the disciples and to those that were serving him and walking with him. But it was not a setback. Jesus' death was a comeback. Because he said, I will rise again. I will come 
and be with you. And he rose and he appeared to over 500 witnesses at the time of his, after the time of his resurrection. And when he was there in the, in the risen in the garden, Mary thought he was a gardener until something happened. And that is he called her name. He called her name. And then all of the awareness within her own spirit began to up, wake up and to realize this is the Jesus that said that he was going to rise in three days. And this setback is not a setback. It is a comeback because he is alive and he has defeated death, hell, and the grave. And with all of this happening, he was bringing them hope. You see, our hope is not in an empty cross that Jesus died on, but our hope is found in that Jesus was raised from the dead and Jesus is alive and well and he is working for us even now as I speak. He's working in your life now as I speak. He's working in the, the world around us just as he will as now even I speak because he is alive and he is well. And he is working for us to do the things that he would desire of our lives, what God would desire, the plans and the purposes which God has for our lives. And this why is why we don't and we do not become devastated by the things in our lives that we feel are setbacks. Maybe our setbacks are preparing us for a comeback. Because the greatest comeback our lives will will ever experience is our lives being changed. Notice, if you will, what Peter says in First Peter chapter one, verse three, where Peter says, "Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ." In his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Notice what he says. He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Folks, that's why today is so important. This why is why 2,000 years ago, this is the greatest day that could ever happen because he brought new life, he brought new hope, and he brought to reality the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We have all been given the opportunity for a new birth. We've all been given that opportunity of a living hope because there is an empty tomb. And Easter reminds us of the mercy and of the grace of God that have been given to us. We haven't been saved by ourselves. In fact, Paul says to the Ephesians in chapter 2 of Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, for it is by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. You see, Easter brings salvation. But salvation is something we all have to experience personally. We have to come into that living life. We have to come into that by faith and to recognize and to acknowledge that the tomb is empty and to know that Jesus Christ is truly the son of the living God. And when we begin to acknowledge that, we move into the reality of the empty tomb and what its fullness and the meaning of the empty tomb really is. And the empty tomb is a representation of life the life that he came to bring you and the life that he came to bring me. And I hope this morning that everyone that I'm speaking to in the sanctuary and everyone that is listening by online has already experienced that life. It is an abundant life. Jesus said, I have come that they might have life and that they might have it, not just life, but that they might have it more abundantly. You see, where life is found is in the empty tomb. It's not found within ourselves. We cannot save ourselves. We cannot rescue ourselves. We are under the all-seeing eye of God, and it is God who has given us the ability to cry upon him, and we, we cry to him. He is the one who brings salvation. It is not of works, lest any man should boast. We cannot do it ourselves. It is what Jesus did for us upon the cross of Calvary. It is him rescuing us from our sin and from our ultimate eternal death. It is what the empty tomb is all about. And it always isn't over until 
it is over. And as we place our faith and our hope and our trust is a resurrected life, we are made new, we are forgiven, we are cleansed, and we experience that resurrection and we live with the reality of living forever with God. This morning, he gives us that opportunity to know him, to know him as he is. He has revealed himself to us through his word. We have the pages of the word of God that gives us the reality of who Jesus really is. He has given us the power of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit will identify with Christ and he comes and he reveals the likeness and the images of Christ within our lives and he gives us a spiritual awakening for the things that God gives are not carnally. We cannot carnally be mindful of them. It is by the Spirit that we come into these things and it is all one thing. Jesus said very pointedly, he said, it is important that I go away. The death. It is important that I go away. Because he said, if I don't go away, the Holy Spirit will not come. Thank God for an empty tomb and the coming of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost and the birth of the church to know that God had breathed life into individual lives. And now we have what we call a, a experience with Christ because we can be born of the Spirit and renewed into his likeness. We can experience the resurrection power of God and we have the hope when we, re when we accept Christ and we experience the resurrection power, we've been given the guarantee that we'll live forever. You see, we're going to live forever one way or another. We'll either live forever in the presence of God or we'll live forever in the presence of demonic forces in the lake of fire. But the case is that we'll live forever. But as Jesus said, follow me, follow me. And so I want to encourage you, if you do not know Christ, I want to encourage you to come and to know Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. And what better time to do it than on an Easter Sunday morning? If you're viewing online, the same does remain. If you do not know him, perhaps today would be the day that you would come and recognize him and put your trust in him. No matter how large, how small, how devastating the setback may have been and may be the holy comeback is possible through Christ. It's not over until he says it's over. Father, this morning, we thank you for the resurrection of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And we know that right now, today, he is alive. He's seated at the right hand of your throne, making intercession for us. He's anticipating the time when you give him the command to come and to receive us as a church unto himself, that we might recognize the promise that he has made to us as believers. He said that if we do believe and we follow, we put our trust in him, that he will come and that we will be where he is, and that we will be where he is and he will come to take us to that place. And so, Lord, thank you for Easter. Thank you for the empty tomb. Thank you for the life that you brought into our lives that we might have life and that we have might have it more abundantly. Lord, I pray if there are those who do not know you, those who are struggling in their relationship with you, those who maybe are going through a difficult time and even coming to the point of turning their back on you, I pray, God, that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would draw them unto yourself, that they would recognize the love of God and how much you would love them. And that's why Jesus came, Jesus lived, Jesus bled, Jesus died, and now he's alive. And we thank you, Lord, for that hope that you have given us today to know that we have an eternal home with you and we praise you for it in Jesus name we thank you Jesus thank you Lord thank you Lord
I'm so thankful this morning that we can declare him as Lord. Jesus Christ is the Lord. We want to recognize that this morning through our time of communion. I trust all have received the communion elements as you came in the door. If you have not, if you just want to raise your hand and we'll have the ushers watching so they can serve you at this time. This is an important time. We recognize the death of Jesus on Good Friday. We recognize his resurrection on Easter. But today we recognize the part of communion, and that is we do show his death until he see him, until he returns. The Bible says, For I have received from the Lord what I also pass on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take this as my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then whoever eats and eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ, eat and drink judgment upon themselves. But I like it says, why do we do this? Why do we celebrate communion? We know it's an ordinance of the church. It's a practice of the church. But why do we do it? It's because we're proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. And we know that he is truly coming again. If you would take your way for this morning. Jesus said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we thank you for the body of Jesus. Lord, we recognize that according to your word that you were marred, you were beaten, you had a crown of thorns planted upon your brow, and we can only imagine the pain and the agony that you were going through as the stripes were laid upon your back. But now, Lord, we can be rejoiced in the fact to know that by your stripes we are healed. And so today as we partake of this bread, we're partaking of it in recognition that this is a symbol of your broken body that you did for us. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' name. Said, so take ye, this is my body. It says then that he took the cup after supper. He said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this in whatever, whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. And so we're doing this again in remembrance of him, the blood that is so important, the blood that has never lost its power, the blood that still brings salvation. The Bible says that without the shedding of blood, there'd be no remission of sins. Thank God for the blood of Jesus. Lord, we thank you for shedding your blood. And we know that every drop of blood that fell to the ground was for us. We were not worthy, but yet you loved us that much. And Lord, we recognize that you gave your life even while we were yet sinners. You died for us. What love. And now as we participate in this cup, 
the symbol of your blood. We thank you for the blood of Jesus and for the remission of our sins that it brings as we give of ourselves to you and we repent of our sins in confession and know that we have a walk with you. Now bless as we share this cup together, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Again, he said, this do in remembrance of me. God is so good. God is so good. You know, to see the what God does, even sometimes when we don't fully recognize it. We're getting ready right now, and the invitations are being sent, sent out for our 50th class reunion. I know I don't look that old, but it is true. It's 50 years since I graduated from high school. And we're starting to see things coming in. But I told my wife today, you know what's neat? There's things that are coming in from my classmates that are talking about the love of God, talking about Easter as being the day of resurrection. People that I would have never thought, they didn't think it of me either, so I guess I'm returning the favor. But this is what God can do. He can change our lives and to make us into what he would have us to be. So we want to just say happy Easter to each and every one of you. Thank you for being with us. We're going to ask uh, Pastor Jeremy if he would if he would close in prayer. And then as you go, remember you, the offering is back there. And um, drop your offering in one of the uh, offering bags. And whether you give that way by giving, or you can give online by going onto the church's website, or you can give by text messaging or through the Tidely app. Whatever way it is, easier for you to give, give, but it's available to you. We ask Pastor Jeremy to sing a chorus for us and then to close for us, if you would. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a wonderful name it is. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a wonderful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a powerful name. What a powerful name it is. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a powerful name it is. Nothing can stand against what a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. And death could not hold you, the veil tore before you. You silenced the boast of sin and grave. The heavens are roaring, the praise of your glory, for you are raised to life again and you have no rival you have no equal now and forever god you reign and yours is the kingdom yours is the glory Yours is the name above all names. What a powerful name it is. A powerful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a powerful name it is. Nothing can stand against. What a powerful name it is. 
the name of Jesus. It's Jesus. Your name is wonderful. Your name is powerful. And we worship you, Lord. We honor you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for what you did on the cross for us. Thank you that we live, that we, we worship a risen Savior. Yes, Lord. God, we thank you for the message that we've received today. I believe it's from you, Lord. So as we leave this place today, God, it's our turn, Lord. It's our turn to go out and to share you with the people that we come in contact with. That's what we're called to do until you come back, Lord. So that's what we're going to do. We worship you. We thank you, Lord. In your name, amen, amen. You were dismissed this morning. If you want to stay, if you want to come to the altar, you're welcome to. Happy Easter. We love each and every one of you guys. What a wonderful name it is. A wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a wonderful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus. And I just want to speak. Over every heart and every mind. Because I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Till every dark addiction starts to fade. Declaring there is hope within your freedom. I speak Jesus. Your name is power. Your name is healing. Your name is life. Break every stronghold. Shine through the shadows, burn like a fire. I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Over every fear and all anxiety. Every soul held captive by depression. I speak Jesus. Your name is power. Your name is healing. Your name is life. Break every stronghold. Shine through the shadows. Burn like a fire. Shine through the shadow.